Hello and welcome everyone to another anime and manga analysis video. Warning, today's video will be a doozy. Not only will this be my longest video, I will also be comparing two very dystopian and thought provoking mangas. Mangas that ask uncomfortable questions about the nature of humanity. I am talking about Hajime Isayama's Attack on Titan and Fujimoto's Fire Punch. Both manga paint an unflattering picture of humanity and ask questions about the morality of vengeance and the necessity of suffering. Through this analysis, I mean to shed light on these various topics and answer the question of what the true nature of humanity is. This video will be full of spoilers if you're not up to date with the manga, so be warned, and some parts will be very much not safe for work. But without further ado, let's get started. To start, I will tell a bit of the story of Attack on Titan and of Fire Punch. Both stories take place in a dystopian world where life is full of uncertainty. Attack on Titan is about a young boy named Aaron Yeager who lives in the city of Paradise. Not much happens in Aaron's life and he spends his days carousing with his friend Mikasa and Armin. Things change though when the wall protecting the people of Paradise is shattered by a titan enormous man-eating creatures who the wall was meant to keep out. In one instance, Eren's peaceful life is thrust into chaos and he loses his family. Eren joins the survey corps with Mikasa and Armin in order to fight the titans. Throughout their fights with the titans, however, it is revealed that Eren has the ability to transform into a titan, a so-called titan shifter, a revelation that turns the world on its head. It is further revealed that Annie, Reiner and Berthold, who are members of the same corps as Eren, are in fact titan shifters as well, and it was them who broke through the wall and so killed Eren's family. Eren vows vengeance and plans to use his titan powers to make them suffer as much as he has. Fire Punch, in comparison, starts out with the main character Agni chopping off his own arm. You see, Agni lives in a world suffering from global cooling. Food is scarce and many people have succumbed to the cold or to opportunists who use the situation to prey on those weaker than them. Social order has broken down and Agni tries to survive while protecting his sister Luna. Agni, like Aaron, is special. He has the ability to heal from most injuries, an ability called a blessing in the world of Fire Punch. He and Luna lost their parents to bandits who were after their food supplies and now live in a village full of elderly and try to make the most of life in their harsh circumstances. Things change for the worse though when Doma, another blessed, invades the village. Doma is an enforcer of the city of Behemdok, a bastion where at least some people can still live, setting the village on fire with his blessing and incinerating both Agni and his sister. However, Agni's blessing has become a curse because as he is burning, his regeneration keeps him alive and Doma's flames have the property of not stopping with burning until the victim is dead. Agni is now caught in an endless cycle of pain and regeneration. He wants to give in to the pain, but Luna with a dying breath tells him to live. Agni, through many years of being caught in this hell, manages to adjust and vows vengeance on Doma. So here we have Eren and Agni, who both have their worlds destroyed by an outside force, but who both have the power to exact vengeance. However, this leads us to the first question. When is vengeance morally justified? As we are taught in the West, vengeance does not solve anything and only begets more vengeance. An eye for an eye makes the whole world blind after all. But there might be cases where this does not apply because there are certain acts that are more despicable than others. These are described by existentialist thinker Simone de Beauvoir as acts of violence that degrade a person, stripping them of their subjectivity and freedom, and treating them as an object, when something is not considered human anymore. Clear examples are the treatment of the Jewish prisoners in concentration camps 
and also in the prison camps of Unit 721, where the Japanese saw their Chinese and Russian prisoners as logs of wood. This is seen in Fire Punch, where the enforcers of Behemdok literally called the people unfortunate enough to be called by them fuel, using any blessed that they catch as human batteries, not even recognizing them as fellow humans anymore. This is also seen in Attack on Titan, when it is revealed that all Titans were once human and were transformed into Titans by the people of Mali, a country on the other side of the ocean where the Eldians, the race of people who can turn into Titans, are heavily oppressed. The Eldians, much like the Blessed in Fire Punch, are turned into mindless objects, living weapons, subjected to a life of torture. Acts like these arouse a primeval need to avenge, to make it right, to obliterate the horror of dehumanization from memory and restore a balance or a natural order where evil once dominated. Essentially, this need is a cry for the restoration of humanity, for the recognition by the abuser that the greatest crime was to treat the victim as non-human, a thing, to make the abuser understand the impact of his crime on another person. Aside from this, Knowing how the Malians treat the Eldians also changes the scope of the story. As we find out from the diary of Ern's father, the Malians send Reiner, Annie and Bertel to Paradis to infiltrate and capture the founding Titan, a special Titan allowing the Possessor to control other Titans, including the enormous Titans that the walls protecting Paradis are made of. It was the threat of these Titans breaking loose and destroying all in their path that has kept Paradise safe all these years. Reiner, Annie and Bertolt's mission to capture it would lead Paradise defenseless against a hostile nation. The plan of the Malians is nothing less but the genocide of the people of Paradise. Aaron currently is the carrier of the founding Titan, so his vengeance is more than just a personal thing between him, Reiner and Bertolt. It concerns the survival of his entire people. In this case, Revenge can serve as a deterrent, to make it clear that aggression will be punished. This is the underlying thought of the just war idea, that fighting a war and sometimes even striking preemptively is allowed if you are certain that an opposing country aims to cause harm to the people of your nation. This is discussed by the characters in Attack on Titan, that the war titans could be used or threatened to be used as a preemptive strike of sorts. The War Titans, once released, would trample all those who stood against them, serving as a deterrent, to make it clear that any aggression against Paradis will be met with swift retribution. While Agni's story is much smaller and more personal, the same point about the dignity of the victims stands. Doma robbed Luna and the other villagers of their dignity, turning them into unrecognizable burnt husks as well as subjecting Agni to an existence not worthy of being called human. Killing Doma would make clear that the actions of Behemdorf will not be tolerated, plus killing him might spare others the same fate, no more people being captured or burned alive. All of this makes revenge almost sound noble. Both Aaron and Agni are avengers who are seeking to restore the dignity of the victims, to restore a certain balance in the world, to punish evil. But in both stories, things become more complex the more we learn. In Attack on Titan, Aaron finds out that the Eldians were for the longest time the rulers of the world, using their titan powers to rule over other peoples with an iron fist, committing genocide on large groups of people and erasing cultures. The Eldians ultimately succumbed to infighting and the remaining Eldians in Mali were enslaved living as second-class citizens. This makes the situation very complicated. Aaron's ancestors were, according to the history books, tyrants, using their titan powers to devour their opposition. So are the people of Mali justified in their mistreatment of the Eldians? In their eyes, every Eldian is part of the usurper race and a ticking time bomb able to change into a devouring titan. In Fire Punch, things are also not quite that simple. Agni eventually catches up with Doma and finds him taking care of a group of children. 
He had renounced his allegiance to the Hamdok, and now strives to make the lives of these children better. Killing Doma would mean dooming these children as well. This puts both Agni and Eren in a morally difficult position. Seeing this cycle of hatred and revenge play out leaves you wondering about the state of humanity, about our true nature. Throughout history, every people on the earth at some time or another was terrible to another people. The Holocaust springs to mind, of course, but there are much more examples. The slaughtering of the Huguenots in Paris on Bretonnes Night, the Sichuan massacre in China. There is bloodshed enough to go around. And the fate of the main characters in Fire Punch and Attack on Titan aside, in both stories there are many people undergoing or committing atrocities. The nobles of Paradise completely willing to abandon the people to save their own heights, as well as the casual cruelty of the enforcers of the Amdok. It makes you wonder, what is the cause of all of this conflict? To determine this, we need to take a look at conflict as well as the motivations and circumstances of several characters in both stories. Let's start by looking at conflict more closely. Conflict, according to the literature, can be caused by scarce resources. This is most clearly seen in Fire Punch, where the main driver of conflict is the global cooling that is going on and the scarcity that accompanies it. People kill each other over food, fuel, and even kidnap others to be used as fuel. Conflict, however, can also occur based on ideological grounds. We see this again in Fire Punch, where the enforcers of the Hemdog justify their cruelty by saying that they are the superior race and that God has decided those weaker than them should just obey. While in Attack on Titan, the Malians use the belief that the Eldians are evil to justify horrific oppression. Example of this is Aaron's aunt, a young child at the time, being torn apart by dogs for the amusement of the Malian gods. Her only crime being an Eldian. In the real world, there are enough examples of this as well. The Aztecs saw the neighboring tribes as sacrifices necessary to appease their gods, tearing out their hearts and skinning them alive. And in the aforementioned Batonimus Night, Huguenot children were converted to Catholicism by baptizing them in the blood of their parents. Remember, I said this video would be a doozy. This may lead you to think that religion and ideology are the true culprits behind conflict in the world, and that a world without religion would be much more peaceful. But I wonder. As Dostoevsky, another famous existentialist writer said, in a society without God, everything is permitted. In a society like that, there are no morals, there is no right or wrong, and life simply becomes a competition between wolves. I do find value in this. I think religion gives us a moral framework which, especially in early society, was necessary. Having a shared system of beliefs allows groups to communicate and relate to each other, preventing a truly horrific world of dog eat dog. This is seen with a character from Attack on Titan, Ymir, who in order to morally support a group of Eldians suffering under Malian rule became a symbol, a god. Her name was not originally Ymir, but in order to help the group, she became a reincarnation of the founder of the Titan race, also named Ymir. The belief in Ymir as a god gave that group solace in difficult times and acted as a glue to hold the group together. Ymir the first Titan is an extremely important character for this video, but that is something that will come back later. We also see the influence of ideology in Fire Punch where Doma tells Agni that the main culprit behind conflict is not a lack of want or food, but a lack of righteous education. As he explains to Agni, he himself believed the indoctrination of the Hemdok, that he and other soldiers were superior to other people and used it to justify their atrocities. He ultimately breaks away from this indoctrination and now raises the children in his care to think for themselves, to live morally and not by consuming others. The power of indoctrination is also seen with Zeke Jaeger, Aaron's half-brother who turned his own parents over to the secret police, condemning his own mother to live like a titan. 
believing the Malians when they said that the Eldians are an evil race and must make amends for the sins of their forefathers. Reiner believed these same things, however much like Doma, eventually saw through the indoctrination. Reiner, having infiltrated the Survey Corps, learns that the people of Paradise are simply people much like him. They have dreams and worries and stupid arguments much like him. This makes Reiner doubt his mission so much, he actually develops somewhat of a personality disorder in order to cope with the guilt. Likewise, Agni's entire mission of vengeance is put to question when he sees the situation with Doma, making him abandon his quest for vengeance. But what is important now is not so much people's thoughts, but their actions. And what Reiner ultimately does is follow his mission, knowing this would mean dooming all of his friends at the survey call. And Agni, even though seemingly abandoning his quest, goes back to the home of Doma and burns both Doma and all of the children alive. It seems that some people have a part that simply likes to kill, to destroy. This is confirmed at the point in the story where Aaron asks Reiner why he still carried out his mission. Reiner admits he did it because he wanted to, because he felt like it. We as humans have something very dark inside of us, something not explained away with scarcity or ideological drives. This inner drive to violence is something that Sigmund Freud saw as ingrained in human nature, as he wrote to Einstein when fascism was running rampant in Europe. When a nation is summoned to engage in war, a whole gamut of human motives may respond to this appeal. High and low motives. Some openly avowed, others slurred over. The lust for aggression and destruction is certainly included. The innumerable cruelties of history and man's daily life confirm its prevalence and strength. While musing on the atrocities recorded on history's page, we feel that the ideal motive has often served as a camouflage for the lust of destruction. Sometimes, as with the cruelties of the Inquisition, it seems that while the ideal motives occupied the foreground of consciousness, they drew their strength from the destructive instincts submerged in the unconscious. As Arthur Schopenhauer, yet another great existentialist thinker said, man is the only animal who causes pain to others with no other object than wanting to do so. But even this is not entirely true. In nature we see all sorts of cruel acts. Cats playing with mice, chimpanzees raping, torturing and killing chimps of other tribes. It seems that everything in nature is designed to devour other things. And this is echoed early on in Attack on Titan. When Mikasa and Eren met for the first time, she had been kidnapped by crooks wanting to sell her off. That is when Eren, only 10 years old at the time, barged in, brutally killing her abductors. As he told her then, the world is cruel, and if you want to live, you have to be cruel. All of this, all of this evil, all of this struggle, all of this bloodshed, can be ascribed to a single drive, a single terrible force that is the reason for humanity's suffering, the will to live. The will to live is an instrumental part of Arthur Schopenhauer's philosophy and is described as an irrational, blind, incessant impulse without knowledge that drives instinctive behaviors, causing an endless, insatiable striving in human existence. If you are born, you have a will to live. You strive for something. But this urge is never satisfied, and people destroy their own lives and the lives of others over it. The will to live is seen with many characters in both stories. Characters desperately chasing or holding on to something simply to escape the horror of existence. Whether it is vengeance, dreams or each other. However, there are two people in both stories that I wish to highlight. The first is Agni, who is the only character for who I think suicide would be the better option. Always living with pain, muscles staring skin burning, bones breaking over and over again. Why doesn't he just give up? And if not for himself, then why not for others? He could have spared a lot of people a lot of pain if he just gave up. If he gave up, the children at Doma's place would still be alive, 
as well as the people he accidentally killed in the Hemdok. But he is driven by something, and I don't think it is vengeance, but love. Love for his sister, whose final words were for him to live. An act of love which doomed him to hell. It is this same love that leads him to later on in the story live a lie with a woman who looks like his sister. This woman named Judah, much like Ymir in Attack on Titan, pretended to be a god to appease the people. But her religion was the religion of the Hemdog, which spurred on Doma to decimate villages, while keeping a system of repression in place for years, leading to a truly dismal life for its inhabitants. And yes, also inadvertently killing Luna. You know, his sister, the girl for whom he's doing all of this? Agni is a slave, a slave of love, never satisfied, always striving. This is also seen in the backstory of the Titan founder Ymir. Ymir in the past was from a Germanic looking tribe which was attacked by the tribe of the Fritz family. Ymir saw her family getting slaughtered and was taken to be a slave, having her tongue cut out. At some point she was accused of letting some pigs go free and was subsequently hunted down by Fritz and his men. Dying, she fell into a chasm underneath a tree where something bonded with her making her the first titan. Now as we see in this panel, she is of gigantic size and she could have torn Fritz and his men limb from limb if she wanted to. But she didn't. She served Fritz, killing his enemies, birthing his children, starting the cycle of bloodshed and insanity. And according to the altar, she did all of this out of love for a man who saw her as nothing more than a tool. Blind, unthinking, slaves to the will to live. Schopenhauer that as such we have no free will. We are completely determined by the way that our bodies react to stimuli and causes and our characters react to motives. And this is supported by Dostoevsky, who said that will is a manifestation of all life, that is of all human life including reason as well as all impulses. Schopenhauer's solution to all of this is to not want, to eradicate all desire. To live the life of a Buddhist ascetic, not desiring anything, not wanting relationships or lofty goals or riches, but a state of willlessness, the only way to ease the suffering of life. Schopenhauer's philosophy was not necessarily a suicidal one, but there is overlap between Schopenhauer's philosophy and Zeke Jaeger's euthanasia plan in Attack on Titan. Zeke is convinced that if the Eldian race was no longer around, all of this bloodshed and suffering would stop. A way to do this is through the path, a kind of collective unconscious for the Eldian race where the first Titan Ymir is still following the decree of her love King Fritz, creating new Titans and taking care of the Eldian race. Zeke, who is a descendant of King Fritz, wants to give Ymir the order to make the Eldians become infertile. This in some way is in line with Schopenhauer's thinking, who saw the world as being inherently so miserable that no one would choose to live in it if the will to live was not forcing them to. Zeke, through this plan, makes the choice for the Eldian race and spares them from being possessed by the will to live in the first place. Zeke's solution is extreme, but is there something to Schopenhauer's idea? Will letting go of desire also stop conflicts in the world? Even if something like that was possible for the entire human race, it also flies in the face of human nature. Earlier I said that Dostoevsky agreed with Schopenhauer that the will is the source of all human behavior, but Dostoevsky rejects the premise that free will does not exist. In fact, he would say that free will and its assertion is a driving force behind human suffering. Dostoevsky writes from experience, going through many hardships throughout his life, from being mock executed to being imprisoned in Siberia. And in Siberia, he saw other prisoners acting against their self-interest and survival simply to assert their freedom of will. He saw prisoners attacking guards, knowing this would result in them running the gauntlet, where they would walk between two lines of men who would beat them mercilessly often resulting in their deaths. 
This is because according to Dostoevsky, we will do anything to prove that we are not simply automatons, going with what society or our body wants. Man is not a piano key. As such, we are capable of making the right choices, but we often choose not to, because we are obsessed with a constant desire to assert our own will and dominance over others, even at the cost of our own well-being. This reckless wanting reminds me of one of the cornerstones of Friedrich Nietzsche's philosophy, the will to power. The will to power, like Dostoevsky's concept of free will, is an irrational drive, not so much occupied with survival as with asserting dominance. It is the drive that lies beneath all of existence. Everything that lives has a will to power. It will strive to grow, spread, cease, become predominant not from any morality or immorality, but because it is living, and because life is simply will to power. Nature, like Dostoevsky, linked to will to humanity's darkest impulses. It is behind the Holocaust, the Holodomor, the Rape of Nanking. But it's also behind the building of the Sistine Chapel, behind the Notre Dame, behind the Taj Mahal, it is behind both, because it is not moral or immoral, it simply has power. However, its destructive potential cannot be understated. And this potential is seen with Agni as well as with Aaron. Agni was finally rid of the flames that consumed him for all those years and lived in relative harmony with Judah and a group of women. He was liked in this community. He had people who cared for him. But when Judah was taken from him, he let himself be emulated in order to get her back. Even though his surrogate family begs him to stay, he becomes fire punch again, going through all of this pain again, knowing that he will have to take lives. While in Attack on Titan, Aaron is planning on releasing the Ball Titans on the world. Not to protect the people of Paradise, necessarily, not to avenge evil, not to restore the dignity of the Eldian race, no, because the world limits his freedom. He cannot stand being restrained in any way, not by the walls of paradise, not by the world who looks at the Eldians with distrust, and not by the Malians who want to invade his home country. So his solution is a preemptive strike, destroying 90% of humanity, leaving only the people of paradise alive. When Aaron was asked why he did this, he responded simply, because I was born into this world. Aaron truly believes that by being born into this world, everybody has the freedom to dream, explore the world and just exist in peace. His motive to eradicate 90% of humanity is based on this idea. Both men are possessed by a wild, irrational will. A will so strong that it even convinces Ime, the first titan, to break loose from King Fritz's will. Aaron and Zeke went a path together, and Zeke gave her the order to make the aliens become infertile. Aaron stops her, however, and asks her what she wants to do. As he says, you are not a god. You are not a slave. You are just a human being. You are free to choose. And this sums up the state of humanity. Aaron, Agni, and Ime are just human beings with free will. Not gods or devils, but just human beings. And as we as humans do when we have the freedom to choose, we often make immoral choices. Add great power to this and the consequences are dire. And this is reflected in the ending of both stories. In Fire Punch, the earth briefly warms up and there is some hope for humanity. But in the end, humans cannot stop asserting their will of others, and they end up destroying themselves. In Attack on Titan, Aaron's actions have brought the world a time of peace. Aaron's attack was stopped prematurely, so 20% of humanity survived. Humanity for a time lacked the capacity for war. But in the end, war did come to the shores of paradise, and it was destroyed. So what does this say about us? What of the questions I asked in the beginning about the nature of humanity or the necessity of suffering? Are we on this earth just to suffer? Are we slaves to our own impulses 
Or do we have the freedom to choose, but do we mostly choose the most immoral option? Are we doomed to destroy ourselves? Yes. No. Maybe. Look, I had a lot of trouble finishing this video because it does look bleak. And I do think that if you are born, you will suffer. You will suffer from your own will or from others trying to lay their will upon you. But there are two things that I hold on to. One is that the will to power is also the underlying force of human achievement. It is responsible for the greatest moments in history. A history that is not just bloodshed and horror. Besides the great works of art, such as the Notre Dame or the Taj Mahal, the will to power is also behind great acts of kindness, especially during a crisis. The Japanese pensioners who volunteered to work in Fukushima. The Christian protesters creating a human barrier in Tahir Square so that the Muslims could pray in peace. Alexander Fleming refusing to patent penicillin. All of these are brought into being by the will to power. The second is that even in the most tragic moments, there is great beauty as well. And this is seen in Attack on Titan, but it's also said by Dostoevsky. When Armin and Zeke meet in the path, they discuss much like I do in this video, the nature and purpose of life. With Zeke taking the nihilist point of view that life is pointless and to keep on living is only prolonging the struggle. But with Armin recalling the small moments in life, racing with his friends on a warm spring day, feeding as squirrels and acorns, staying aside on a rainy day to read. As he says to Zeke, maybe his purpose for living is for these small moments. A point of view which is echoed by Dostoevsky when he says, look around you at the gifts of God, the clear sky, the pure air, the tender grass, the birds. Nature is beautiful and sinless and we, only we, are sinful and foolish. And we don't understand that life is heaven, for we only have to understand that and it will at once be fulfilled in all its beauty. Not to be all sappy, but I do think heaven and hell are in our hands and that there's always a choice. But in times of crisis, there will always be people who help and that between all of the tragedy, there will always be moments of beauty. A beauty of which Dostoevsky once said that it will save the world. Let's hope it will. This was my analysis of Fire Punch and Attack on Titan. I hope you liked it. I will leave you now for the remainder of the video with the things that I find beautiful. In the meantime, subscribe if you want more content, and I'll see you next time.